Chapter 21 of the book of Numbers has one of the more iconic stories we've heard about the life of Moses. This is the fiery serpent chapter. Some fun things we get to learn today. Okay, so chapter 21, uh, the children of Israel destroy those Canaanites who fight against them. The Israelites are plagued with fiery serpents. Moses lifts up a serpent of brass to save those who look thereon. Israel defeats the Amorites, destroys the people of Bashan, and occupies their lands. Some fun, fun things we get to go into here. <coughs> so, uh, something that's uh, really interesting here is uh, the the Amorites. Okay, this is, I got a little footnote here that's interesting. Um, the Amorites, who are these Amorites? We're going to talk a bit more about them, but I wanted to get into just, just kind of set some context for them. These people, the Amorites, they came on the scene. Uh, they started to be found at the end of the Ur three period. So if you're familiar with some of your historic uh, ancient periods, Ur three period is where they came in. They spoke Amorite, but they actually wrote in cuneiform, uh, and they they lived in eastern Iraq. So they you know, remember eastern Iraq puts them on the Iran border over near Iran, um, where you're going to get uh, Persia later on and uh, those areas as well. So uh, they are a pretty old group of people uh, that kind of show up on the historical scene and are there. Basically, that, that's kind of where they were at. Okay, now let's get into here. Verse 1, when King Ered, the Canaanite, <clears throat> uh, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. <clears throat> so King Ered is a, a Canaanite. Remember, Canaanite is, Canaan is this land broad land where the Israelites were getting their inheritance up in that area. So there's this King uh, Ered, and he lives up there right now, and uh, at the south end of it, basically. And his spies, he sent out spies, and he heard Israel was coming, the children of Israel, and he found them. And so he fought them, and he actually um, ended up uh, getting some of them prisoner. So let's... let's uh, these are, these, there's some really interesting things in here. In the Bible Dictionary, of course, you learn wilderness exodus. Is a little bit more about that. Because remember, we talked about last time that we don't have a ton of the 38 some odd years that they were in the wilderness. That we don't have a lot of detail in that. that. That time period, we get a couple highlights and then that's it, basically. So what's interesting, though, is these conquests that we hear of consist of the stories from the Habiri, from Yapahi, King of Gezer, who wrote, who wore to the, who, excuse me, who wrote to the Egyptian monarch, voicing an appeal for help, while others declared the Hibiri are stronger than we. So these, the Israelites came in here and were just knocking people out. Basically, we're going to learn more about that today uh, in this chapter. And so they're writing to Egypt to say, come help us. And Egypt's like, but you guys are a little bit stronger than us, so we're not going to come to your help. Now, what's interesting is these letters, we can find the, these letters in a in a writing called the uh, El Armana letters. It's an ancient, uh, uh, I wouldn't say apocryphal writings, but just ancient writings that uh, we have from Egypt. So the El Armana letters give us some insight into the what was happening with these people at this time, basically. So if you want, you can dig those up dig those up. That meant it was kind of a bad story there, but just you can go out and research these more. Uh, so verse two, and Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And so uh, Israel is speaking to God. And so this is probably through Moses because he has not left yet. Uh, verse three, the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them in their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. Now, here's the thing that, that's important to understand is the Israelites, and we don't have a lot of the, all the full details on this. The El Amarna letters can probably give us a little bit more insight in them. I have not read those through myself. Um, just know that they're there and we can look those up for some more information. I haven't gone through them yet. Uh, but here's the thing is realize that uh, Israel's not seeking to destroy the Canaanites. Israel's seeking to get to their promised land. The Canaanites attacked Israel from what it looks on here. 
They came by way of spies and he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So it wasn't Israel coming into Canaan. It was Canaan basically coming out to get to take care of Israel. So he had spies out there. He was he was waiting for something to happen. So Israel is in a defensive position. They're fighting from a defensive position here. And now they have some of their people are prisoners. And now they're going to go in and take care of those prisoners and, and resolve this. And that's what ends up happening. Basically, they wipe them out. Uh, verse four, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. So this is something that's interesting here. Going around Edom. So Edom is a location. They're going around it by the Red Sea, basically. Uh, Edom is, is rough ground. It's a serious desert. There's a lot of challenges there. So they decide, you know, it's going to be easier to go around this than try to go through this, this area. So they went around it, basically. Uh, and the people were discouraged because of the way. It's a hard area. It's tough. It's, it's a challenge to go there. Verse 5, and the people spake against God and against Moses. So there's where Moses is mentioned. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, there is neither water, and our soul loath, loatheth in this light bread. So here's what happens. Life gets tough. Israel gripes and complains and starts to accuse Moses of basically slowly killing everybody off. I I mean, these are the stories we've heard through the last, for that, that wandering in the wilderness. Remember, as soon as they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, they complained. They, had, they didn't have food, they complained. God gave them food. They complained when they got to the promised land, and they were afraid of the people. So God said, you're going to wander for 40 years. They complained that they didn't have water, they, get, they got water. They complained when people were going to come fight them, they won, God helped them out, got them taken care of. This is a crazy bunch of people. Uh, admittedly. So here's what's going to happen. They're complaining again against God and what he has done for them. So verse six, and the Lord sent fiery serpents uh, among the people and they bit the people in so much uh, and much of the people of Israel died. Now, if you look at the footnotes for six A for fire, it means poisonous. So a whole bunch of poisonous snakes come out and start biting people and people are getting sick and dying. Verse seven, Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So now the people are humble and they realize we've done wrong. We need to get this taken care of. Although I don't honestly believe they, they admit that they've done wrong. They just realize that they're being punished for doing something, basically. And so they want to, they want it to stop. Basically, I don't think they're truly repentant. They just want, it, want the pain to stop. So verse eight, the Lord said unto Moses, so this is revelation to Moses, answer to their prayer, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Oboth. Okay, so there's something that's important to look at this. There's a quote here. I believe this is uh, Hugh Nibley says this. Uh, we actually have some insight into this from Alma chapter 33, verses 19 and 20. If you look those up in the Book of Mormon, they talk about this experience. So here's, here's what's said. The traditional way, oh no, that actually, this is something uh, I wrote down from a, a listening to a church historian. So the traditional way most people think of the snake on a pole is having the snake wrapped around the pole, like the modern medicine symbol. That's, some people believe that's where the modern medicine symbol came from. The pole with a snake wrapped around it is this healing serpent idea from the, the, this story, actually, from ancient history. Uh, if you look at the graphic that we use on the thumbnails for our videos for the Book of Numbers, it's a depiction of this scene. Although it looks like a, a pole with a snake kind of in an S shape on it rather than wrapped around it. So a lot of people think the pole was either it was a snake in an S shape nailed to it or the, pole, the snake was wrapped around the pole, basically, like the modern medical symbol. Uh, but many scholars believe this is not how Moses did it. In the creation stories, we know the snakes are used to represent Satan. The snakes were killing the people with poison. 
the snake on Moses' staff does, does not represent Christ. In the Americas, Christ is known as Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. In the ancient Americas, the snake symbolized the god of earth, and the Quetzal bird symbolized the god of heaven. This representation of Christ came from, of course, an apostate people. Quetzalcoatl idea was from the people uh, after the gospel, after the, the, the church had been destroyed, the people gone apostate, uh, after the Book of Mormon times, basically. Uh, it would be more correct to have the snake in a straight line mounted to Moses' staff perpendicularly, thus being in the shape of a cross. The snake is not what heals, it is what it represents that is the healer. So here's the thing that's important for us to look at is a lot of scholars believe it would have been easier for Moses to make a serpent, a, a metal snake, basically brazen serpent, that was straight. And so he had a pole and he nailed, the, nailed it this way, perpendicular to the pole across it. So the pole was vertical, the snake was horizontal. So it looked like a cross, basically, is what they say is what it most likely would have done. And it's not that the, it's not that this serpent, this metal serpent, had any special magical powers given to it, but it's what it represented, which is the cross, the sacrifice of Jesus. So the cross was a cursed way to die because of Moses' staff. Christ died on the cross to signify overcoming physical and spiritual death. The atonement is what is represented. The children of Israel were rebelling against God. The serpents biting people were killing them. Satan was spiritually killing them. It seems amazing at how many people died when all they had to do was look up. Now, here's the thing. This is, we hear this a lot, okay? We hear this a lot. Oh, you just had to look up at the serpent and you lived. And how many people would not look at the serpent? That's, we hear that often, okay? This is not uncommon when we go through these stories uh, in like gospel doctrine classes or seminaries or things like that. But here's the reality of the situation, though, okay? At this time, the children of Israel were probably numbering around three million people. So we're not talking a group of people that was that could fit like on a football field. We're talking a group of people that would take a couple miles of space to, to live in, basically, to be in. <clears throat> so these people probably had to travel a mile or two at least to get to this pole so that they could see it. Now, they didn't have cars or anything like that, so you had to be stuck in a wagon and pulled, someone had to pull you or you had to walk for over a mile to get to this. So there was a lot of effort these people had to do to actually get to see the pole. And now some of them probably saw it from a far distance and it still healed them. Once they realized what the pole was representing, they could see it well, they might've been healed at a distance. They didn't have to be like right up close to it either. But it's fascinating, okay? There's some misconception ideas. I wanted to give a perspective to help clarify some of these things. Most likely, the, the snake was straight, and it was nailed horizontally to the vertical pole. So it looked like a cross. Okay, Because of this, according to some of the stories in history, the cross was a cursed way to die because of, because of this story from Moses, basically. Uh, not to mention, it's just a bad way to die if you think about it anyways. But the symbol is more important than the serpent itself. Okay? The symbol of the atonement of Jesus Christ is what is the key thing that we need to understand here, is that the Christ's atonement helps us with physical and spiritual death. Okay, those are two important things to look at. When we look at physical death, we want to think of the word redemption. Okay, the, that is an important word. Joseph Fielding Smith talks about this. That's one of the key words of the gospel. Because to redeem something is to bring it back or to restore it back to the way it used to be or bring things together. That is resurrection. That's the atonement. We, when we die, we, our spirits and our bodies are separated. And so we need to gain them back. To be resurrected, we gain them back in a perfect form. That is redemption. Okay. The Christ brings us that redemption from physical death. Now, spiritual death, we want to think of the word salvation. Salvation means to save something or to preserve it from being lost. So spiritual death is leaving, is being basically existing outside the presence of God, outside of his influence and his presence. So being saved through the atonement means we get a chance to be in his presence or his influence once again. That is 
overcoming spiritual death. So that's salvation. Okay, so those are important things to look at. So realize this wasn't so simple for the children of Israel to just look up. They had to travel a mile or so at least to get to where they could do this. And if they were poisoned, then their family had to drag them out there or somebody who was healthy could drag them out there or they just had to fight through it and keep moving to get to the point where they could. So they're still suffering. They're still pain. They're still overcoming things, but it took them effort to get to where they could see the cross, basically this brazen serpent on a pole in the shape of a cross. So there's still effort required. There's still things for even us to do through that repentance. And there's pain sometimes we experience, but we can have salvation and redemption because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. If you have any thoughts on this or ideas, please leave them in the comments. I'd love to hear your your, uh, interpretations and ideas on this as well. Okay, so let's jump forward here and just keep moving on. Uh, Verse 11, and they journeyed from Oboth and pitched at Aijah Abram, Abarim in the wilderness, which is before Moab, toward the sun rising. So towards the east, probably, or facing east. From thence, they removed and pitched in the valley of Zered. So this is just kind of saying, here's where they went, and then they stayed here for a bit, and then they went up to here. Okay, and you can look up a lot of these in the Bible dictionaries as well. Now, verse 13, from thence, they removed and pitched on the other side of Arnon, which is in the Bible dictionary, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coasts of the Amorites. Remember, we talked about Amorites. They were actually eastern Iraq. Okay, so we're heading, the Israelites are kind of heading east to kind of go around. It's what it seems like. Uh, For Arnon is the border of Moab between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore, it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon. So there's stories of things that have happened in this area. Uh, But the book of the wars of the Lord, that's the title. We do not have that book. That is a lost book in history. We don't know where that one is. At least I haven't seen anything. If you know where it is, great. Please put some uh, links down where I can download that one and and read the English uh, translation of it. If you want, in fact, in the Bible dictionary, there is a title back there called Lost Books that gives you a list of all the books that are mentioned in the scriptures that we do not have access to. So look that up in the Bible dictionary, Lost Books. Some really interesting books back there. A lot more for us, really, than what we're getting. Honestly, there's a lot more out there. Now, verse 15, at the stream of the brooks that goeth down to the dwelling of Ar and lieth upon the border of Moab... Okay, and from thence they went to Beer, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. So now they're at this well, they're going to get watered, get things taken care of. Verse 17, then Israel sang the song, spring up a well, sing ye unto it. The princes digged the well, the nobles of the people digged it, and by dire- by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves, and from the wilderness they went to Matana. From Matana to Nahalil, and from Nahalil to Bamoth, from Bamoth in the valley that is in the country of Moab, to the top of Pisgah, and looked toward Jeshimon. So they're they're up in this area, and they're kind of coming down. They kind of went east a ways, and now they're kind of coming back around and in to to get into their land, basically. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse twenty one, and Israel sent messengers unto Sion the king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well, but we will go along by the king's highway until we be past thy borders. Again, the same thing they said to uh, Esau, remember? The the descendants of Esau, last chapter, they said the same thing. Now, something that's interesting here, and this is is coming out of uh, the Habiri of the El Amarna tablet, the subjugation of Sion, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, whose land became the country of the Reubenites, is but another item in the story of the invasions of the Habiri. So there's a lot in the El Armana tablet to learn about this from another perspective, basically. So let's go into verse 23. This is what Sion said. And Sion would not suffer Israel to pass through his border, but Sion gathered all his people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness. 
and he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. So again, he's deciding, I'm not going to let you through. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy you. So he goes out. He is the aggressor. He's going to Israel to fight them, basically. So Israel's the defender again. Israel, verse 24, and Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon unto Jabbok, even until the children of Ammon. For the border of the children of Ammon was strong. So they're not messing with Ammon, basically. Now, Ammon, this is interesting. Ammon is, is also a Book of Mormon name. Ammon, there's a, uh, we hear a lot about, he's one of the uh, sons of, a great missionary son of uh, King Mosiah uh, in the Alma chapters. But to Ammon, or Amun was also a god of Egypt. So that could have been where they came down to the children of Ammon or the followers of Amun, which is more Egypt type area, basically. Verse 25, and Israel took all these cities and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites in Heshbon and in all the villages thereof. For Heshbon was the city of Sion, the king of the Amorites who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon. Wherefore, they that speak in Proverbs say, Come into Heshbon, let the city of Sion be built and prepared. For there is a fire gone out of Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sion. It hath consumed Ar of Moab and the lords of the high places of Arnon. Woe to thee, Moab, thou art done, O people of Chemosh. He hath given his sons that escaped and his daughters into captivity unto Sion, king of the Amorites. We have shot at them, Heshbon is perished, even unto Dibon. And we have laid them waste even unto Nopha, which reacheth unto Mecca, Medeba. Thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. So that section right there that I just read is basically a, a, a literary piece, uh, like a poem or, a, or a, kind of like a little song or a ballad, talking about and memorializing that the Amorites came in and they actually took a lot of land from the Moabites and they pushed them back. And occupied a big area, basically, and the Amorites was was a force to be reckoned with back then, and had and uh, had done a lot, basically. So a lot of those names of places you could look them up in the Bible dictionary to get a bit more about those lands and geography. Were it, this is still Middle East, so probably everywhere from the Mediterranean Sea over to what we call present day Iraq and Iran, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia. Uh, what would be like Syria, Jerusalem, Jordan, all those areas, okay? That's kind of this whole area, basically, that we're talking about. Uh, not quite, probably up to close to the Hittite areas where Turkey and thing are, but close. We're probably getting near those borders, basically. And then, of course, Egypt is down there. Egypt's still a well-established place because that's where the Israelites came from. But that's the basic area that this is all happening in, okay? All right, verse 32, and Moses sent out sent to spy out Jazer, and they took the villages thereof and drove out the Amorites that were there. And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to the battle at Edri. All, again, all these names are in the book of Bible Dictionary. You can look them up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand, and all his people, and his land, and thou shalt do to him as thou didst to Sion the king of Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him and his sons and all his people until there was none left him alive and they possessed the land. So they have now occupied and wiped out numerous groups of people that were in this area around and near where their uh, promised land is, probably even part of the promised land. But they, these people weren't willing to work with the children of Israel. So they got wiped out, basically. They all got taken, taken out. The Israelites are really strong and they have God on their side. I'm sure by now a lot of the the, the legends are, are spreading, the rumors are spreading through the area, realizing that, holy cow, Israel is wiping out several well-established nations. These people who are really strong are being wiped out by Israel. This is wild. Now, they haven't quite got into the promised land yet, but this is they kind of inherit some of these lands as well as they go along. So we're, uh, we've still got more to tell on those stories of getting into the full promised land where the milk and honey and all that stuff was that uh, Joshua and, and uh, the rest saw. Um, but yeah, I'm sure this is not boding well for a lot of the other, these other nations going, man, Israel's wiping people out left and right. This is crazy. I hope they don't come my direction. So, hey, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. And uh, hopefully you're liking these videos. Share them. If you are, 
uh, hit the like button. That does help uh, make it easier for us to get more people to see the videos on uh, YouTube and uh, share links out to them as well to encourage more people to come follow. And uh, we'll see more of this story in the continuation in the next chapter.